strongly in the media, how they're turning facts on their heads in relation to Ukraine in particular. So obfuscation is the name of the rule for the bourgeoisie because that's in their interests. In the working class interests, clarity, understanding is what we need. And Marxism alone, Marxism and Leninism gives us that understanding. But only the party can bring it to the working class. Now, there are lots of forces working against that. The bourgeoisie are very, very skilled at undermining any spark of revolutionary understanding or activity on the part of the working class. And in, the, in England, or in Britain, we, are, we have an extremely experienced bourgeoisie. I mean, the bourgeois ex, uh, bourgeoisie really dates from the time of the Reformation and it's only got experience over the years. And since the industrialization, still you've got a couple of hundred years, more than that, for it to get used to managing an industrial proletariat. So we have an experienced bourgeoisie that we're up against, and we mustn't underestimate their, their power. Um, and back in the 60s, we was, when, when I first joined the movement, or became involved, became aware of it even, um, the Activities of Khrushchev were still very recent. And the, the revisionist forces, the old communist parties that, fought, that solid meekly along, were still very strong and numerically very strong. And of course, the Trotskyists were immensely in, um, emboldened and strengthened by Khrushchev. They had in common, didn't they? They both vilified Stalin. So they, so that they were the strongest force in the movement of the 60s. But they were anti-revisionists but we were scattered in not just a few, dozens and dozens of little groups. If any of you have seen that wonderful film, Monty, um, The Life of Brian, <laughs> um, you will remember the scene in the amphitheater. Yes. We have about five people, three there, two there. PSJ. And I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to misquote. I know you're going to, you're going to say to me this is the wrong name, but you get the feeling. One is saying, we're the popular front for the liberation of Palestine. No, no, we're the people's front for the liberation of pa Palestine. Splittists! <laughs> <laughs> that was actually the accurate reflection of the working class movement at that time. The, move, the, the, the organisations were very small. Now, back in the 60s, there was an attempt to form Communist Party of Britain, Marxist, Leninist, I think it was. No, that wasn't the same. Communist Party of Britain, Marxist, Leninist, I think. So organisations, including ones that I was involved with, came together with trade unionists and others. And the, the spirit was there, the will was there, but it didn't work. Why didn't it work? There was actually no theoretical understanding of what was revisionism, why it had become dominant, what was the situation in Britain at that time, or in the world even, what were the class forces in Britain, there was no theoretical analysis or understanding on which to base any policies. So it's not enough just to have the will, the emotional desire to have a party. It's got to be founded in study of Marxism and Leninism. And our speakers today have been in the forefront of that work to do the theoretical work and provide the basis on which the party was formed 16 years ago. 18 years ago. <laughs> I knew I'd get it wrong. <laughs> um, and that was why our party was able to survive 18 years. That one didn't even survive 18 months. Mm. Wasn't enough just to have the emotional desire for it. You have to have a solid basis for it. So the theoretical basis, and then on top of that, democratic centralism. And that is very precious. We have faced during those 18 years a number of situations where difficult issues have come to the fore in relation to the, the movement in this country. So Scottish independence, um, ID politics, um, I'm sure there are others. Brexit. Brexit. Brexit, Brexit, thank you. Immigration. <laughs> Immigration, yes. 9 All of these had to be 
discussed in depth amongst the party members, brought to a Congress, thrashed out of the Congress in relation to um, under you know, various resolutions and counter revolutions. It was never a single, single, never a case where there was just one line. It was, it was perfectly obvious to everyone from the outset. No. So in the end, as a result of that process, a policy was formed. And then that was a critical crunch. At every point, some people left. They couldn't stomach the policy. Others understood that even if they disagreed, like our beloved Deborah didn't agree with I think it was independence, wasn't it? I think Scottish independence. Immigration. Immigration, one of them anyway. <laughs> but she realized it was more important to stay with the party and work with the party and help grow the party. And in the end, I think she was convinced. But convinced or not, the fact is she understood the importance of democratic centrism. Now, what we have faced at the moment is opportunism and liquidationism, basically united in a single trend. And we have to survive and we have to grow and we have to strengthen ourselves after that. But it's not new. Back in the 60s, there were comrades I was working with, or we were working with then, thought the only thing to do, the only way to be a proper communist, give up their jobs, get a, get a job working in a factory, on the factory floor, and that was the only way they could be a communist. And of course, that is really worshipping spontaneity, because it's saying you have to be a worker. So the question of working class ideology was secondary to them, to, in a sense, to, to, to worshipping, in a sense, the working class in its existing form, being part of it in its existing form. Well, we wouldn't have Marxism if Marx and Engels had decided we can't possibly be part of the bourgeois intelligentsia. We have to go and work on the factory floor. <laughs> They'd have had no time, no capital. no capital, no energy, nothing. Wouldn't have happened. So we have to look at the essence, not at the form. And there was also a lot of people at every stage as this happened. Do not talk about proletarian internationalism. Do not talk, or the dictator of the proletariat. Do not use the word proletariat. People don't understand it. The thing is, is to get the working class, the advanced working class, to understand it. Not to condescend, not to say, oh, they're, they're too thick. As our speakers have so brilliantly illustrated, as Lenin was saying, way back, exactly the same things that we need to think of now. Um, and well, I don't need to add anything on liquidation because <laughs> it's been said and we all know what the situation is at the moment. Um, but we have to understand the importance of theory and we have to fight to keep and strengthen our party because that is the only hope, not just for us, but for the working class. And the working class so desperately needs a proletarian revolution. If you look at all the disasters around us in every, in every sphere of life, um, you know, we need the proletariat to take charge and, and substitute for this market economy rampant exploitation of people and the environment with a planned economy. There is no, there's no third way. It's a hard road, but it'll be worth it when we get there. Thank you, Comrade Cathy. That was lovely. Puts a lot of things into perspective for us. It's good to have. It's one of the things I've felt for in this, this recent period, actually. Um, and it's interesting to sense the difference as you become older. Well, maybe it's because I'm getting old myself. The older I get, the less ready I feel. The, the more I'm aware of how much I value the experience of the older comrades we still have around us and how one of the most powerful things the communist movement does is connect the fervor, the energy, the enthusiasm, enthusiasm of the youth with the experience, the knowledge, the wisdom, the theoretical depth of the elders. And that it's the bourgeoisie that tries to separate those two things and tell us that we mustn't listen to old people. Don't listen to Marx and Engels, they're from a long time ago. They're white, they're European, they've got nothing to do, they're men, they've got beards. They're all, look at all these reasons why you shouldn't listen to them. Don't listen, don't, listen to the old, don't listen to the old people in your own organization. They're disconnected, they're, they're isolated, they don't know, they're not out on the street. Don't listen to anybody 
who hasn't been on a demonstration in the last week because they don't know what's going on. They don't know how things are. There's a million ways in which these ideas of, you know, um, keeping ourselves separate from the experience that we desperately need uh, are, are pushed into our ranks. And in fact, there's a good reason for that because the bourgeoisie rehashes its ideas constantly. And anyone who's experienced in Marxism can tell you that. If you go back and read Marx's Poverty of Philosophy, which was written against <coughs> the working class philosopher that Dad mentioned in his talk earlier, Proudhon, you will find the ideas in there are being rehashed and recycled today. The ruling class doesn't tell you, oh, by the way, this is actually Proudhon, again, for the 300th time. They always present it as it's somebody's great new idea, the new solution to the new problems. New problems we've got now, not the old problems. We've got new problems now. We need new solutions. Here's a new solution. And they'll put a hashtag on it now for you. <laughs> it won't look like it looked in Proudhon's day, but the essence is exactly the same. They bring it round and around and around and around. They repackage them. Well, people who are experienced in the movement, people who are experienced in studying Marxism, can spot this and help you to shortcut in your experience and learn that more quickly than, than having to spend three decades reading every word that Marx wrote. They can point you to the page where you can read it and understand for yourself. You need access to that experience and that knowledge, comrades, in order to fight well. And when we have comrades like Rapal, like Ella, like Comrade Cathy there, who have been in the movement for six decades, they can also tell you about where these fads go to. These, you know, they've seen so many movements rise and fall. You can make a big movement in the right conditions with the right slogan at the right moment with a following wind and some good publicity. The question is, where does it end up? And if it doesn't go anywhere, why not? These are important questions for us. Because we're not here to say, get to the end of our life and say, you know, once upon a time, I stood in front of a demonstration. There were 100,000 people there. Well, I win. There were 2 million people <laughs> under the science. So, you know, and then, you know, write a book about it, the day that I was in front of a big demonstration. You know? What is it we're trying to... Or I got paid for writing, you know, 15 books and people would come to my lectures and I addressed lecture halls with 30,000 people in them. I've been in front of a stadium shouting my name. And now I'm at home making jam. And, <laughs> and the system remains the same. So what are we here for? Are we here to feel good about ourselves as individuals, to feel important, uh, to feel you know, that we've achieved a status? Is that our aim? Or are we here to assist the working class to achieve its liberation? <laughs> so if it's the second one, we have to be in it to win it, right? And if, you're, if you want to win, you've got to be prepared to learn about what doesn't win and why not, and organize in the way that does. Why do we study Lenin so closely? He wrote the manual on how to win. Every page of Lenin is about how do we organize to win? Who are our allies and why? How do we lead them and why? Why is it us who has to lead and not them? Constantly along the way, every bit of Lenin's theory is preparing the ground for the next bit of the struggle so you can organize, so you can bring your forces together, so you can line them all up together against the status quo and smash it. And not only smash it like with bricks, but smash it so it can't get up again and replace it with something that offers the working class a future. These are not small tasks. It does seem totally overwhelming a lot of the time, the task that is in front of us. And you can see it, look, there's just a few of us in a room. How ridiculous to sit here and talk about smashing the system. Mm -hmm. If that's the job that needs to be done, and we're the people who've understood that it needs to be done, then we have to start the work of making it happen. <laughs> Rajiv's just into jam now that I've said that. Uh, sorry, I was, I was just responding to Comrade Cathy there and went off on one, but um, who? Comrade Nina.
the, the best of jump for the masses, <laughs> the best of, of, of a civilization of our culture for the masses. Um, the, um, Harpal mentioned the word continuum that is not just the 60 years of the continuum that we are part of. It's the continuum that takes us back to Lenin. A and that is a tremendous honor um, to be able to say that we don't read Lenin to have an academic career. We don't read Lenin as a book club. We try to save Lenin from those who quote Lenin in order to distort what the Communist Party should be doing right now in the concrete material conditions that we face. And, and, and what Ella said, that there is nothing more practical than theory, quoting that psychologist. The theory that we use is the theory of class analysis, analyzing the concrete. It's not abstract. And, and that we only see when we engage with class analysis in giving that consciousness to every economic demand that is put in front of us. Because we do need to advance economic demands. But as communists, we don't stay there. And for that, you, you, you do need a deeper analysis. And I feel, as a teacher, what I see is that they fight this uh, betterment of humanity from a very, very young age. This idea that you can actually make mistakes that you need to correct, that, that there is a correct line somehow, even in tracing letters. You know that children do not learn to trace letters or numbers anymore? They use, you know, they, they infantilize children for longer times, believing that we allow their creativity. It's true, there is an element of this, but for how long before you actually teach them that this is a letter, this is a number? And then when they go to university, this worshiping of spontaneity continues in their studies. Um, and this worshiping of spontaneity, I, I'm, my daughter asked me who Rosa Luxemburg was. And I had to show her something that is actually amounting to um, a worship of spontaneity and a worship of defeat for whoever is a revolutionary. So the, um, uh, the system of education, the system we live in, uh, celebrates communists who are dead and who died defeated, yeah. and who died or even committed suicide, proving that this dream of changing the world is, 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 is never going to win. And they teach that at the very moment that they teach children about Rosa Luxemburg. They don't teach about uh, Rosa's uh, theory of imperialism. But they will say, or they will not um, make uh, clear the, the discrepancies, the differences between her and Lenin that caused Rosa to, 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 to be defeated, right? To die. In any case, what I want to say is that this different level of cautiousness that we try to achieve us in the development of our cadres, in the development of, of how, what we do with study groups, right? Uh, why we invite people in study groups is so that our consciousness is raised from the spontaneous, from the anger, to, to, to us being ready to apply Lenin, after we have read <laughs> Lenin, to apply Lenin to the concrete situation facing us, especially when it comes to his theory of imperialism and what we are facing, the anti-imperialist work that we need to do in this country. Because 60 years doing that work in an imperialist country is no mean feat. And it will become increasingly challenging, and we need to be prepared for that. So yes, there's no bigger honor than being a member of the Communist Party. Also, there's no bigger, bigger challenge and responsibility, but I think we are all proud to say that we are part of this continuum. And thank you very much for clarifying those concepts. The floor is open. It's clear tea time. You're all either very satisfied or very shy. <laughs> Uh, well, or the first. <laughs> the very, very, Lucy says very satisfied. Very, very 
Very satisfied. Lutie says very satisfied. Dad yes. thinks you're just hungry. <laughs> uh, well, I've got a couple... A couple <laughs> Ranjit's just obsessed with jam. That's right. I've got a couple more things rounding up then to say. If you suddenly, while I'm rounding up, if you suddenly think of something, feel free and we'll go on a bit longer. But otherwise, this is, this is me rounding up. Um, so I just wanted to highlight again that quote um, from Engels that Ella cited during her talk. Uh, that socialism, since it has become a science, must be pursued as a science, that is, it must be studied. We have to study to understand the conditions of our world. We have to study scientific socialism in order that we can use it. Scientific socialism is the ideology of the working class in its struggle to overthrow the present economic order and replace it with a new one. That is what scientific socialism is. It's not the words of some dead white European from a long time ago. It is the discovery of laws, of the development of history, the discovery of laws, of the operation of capitalist system, capitalist production relations. These are scientific discoveries. They are not ideas. It's not some bloke going, hmm, interesting, I wonder if this, that, the other. No, it's like the same way Darwin discovered laws of the evolution of species through careful analysis of data over many decades. That is what Marx did. That's why the science bears his name. But what it is, is science, Marxism is scientific socialism, the ideology of the working class in struggle that is why we study it, okay? So that's what theory is for. That's why, that's why we study, that's, that's why we need it. Who can understand it? Anybody who wants to. Never imagine there's a person who's not capable of understanding Marxism. The capability comes from the motivation. The second you care enough to try and understand it, you understand it. It's very accessible. Why is it accessible? Because it describes reality. Second you actually pick up and engage with a text by Marx, Engels, Lenin, Stalin, really engage with it and think about what it's telling you because you want to understand, a light goes on. And it's a light you can't turn off again because suddenly you see reality without the veil that's been put in front of your eyes by all of the bourgeois propaganda and it peels it away. It's very, very powerful. That's exactly why it's vilified by our rulers, because it's so powerful, because it enables you to resist their lies. Once you have this weapon, you become strong. An organization that has this weapon is very strong indeed. So we don't dumb down our theory. We try to raise workers. We try to bring this theory to their attention. First of all, we bring it to their attention by giving to them small pieces of it in a simple form. But we're trying to lay the trail to say to them, come and take this theory for yourself. I don't want to be your guru. We, I'm definitely not Ranjit's guru. We don't want to be your guru. We are not here on this platform to give you the truth. We are here to tell you that a weapon exists. And if you like the things you hear from this platform and you think, oh, wow, those people, they seem to know something. What is it we know? We just spent some time studying Marxism and trying to put it into practice. It's Marxism that makes these people here <laughs> seem, seem so clever, right? There's no inherent genius up here. The genius comes from the science. The science can be acquired by anybody who wants to acquire it. Our job is to inspire as many people as possible to want to acquire it. We will, it will lift you up. So was, that, was that all in the Engels quote that you were reading? That was all in the Engels quote, yeah. That's, that's, that's all Engels. He's brilliant. So we... So we desperately need to promote workers' political understanding because they are the ones who are going to move history and society forwards. It's not gonna come from this room. It's gonna come from the masses. Ella said it herself. But they need to understand what their role is, why it's necessary, how they're gonna do it. All of that Marxism can teach them. Not us. 
I'm not going to teach it to them. Hapal's not going to teach it to them. Marxism teaches it to them. We try to bring Marxism to them. That's our job. Because we've, we have understood that that's what Marxism can do. And because we've understood it, we then work to bring that understanding to others. So that is why Lenin said that, ended that book, What is to be Done, with that famous quote, without a revolutionary theory, there can be no revolutionary movement. If we leave workers to the trade union spontaneous struggle, we are dooming them to go in circles forever. Sometimes they'll be angry enough and well organized enough to win some good concessions. And then they will lose them again. And they will go round and round, but it's not even round and round, and it's down and down in a spiral. Because the crisis of capitalism, since capitalism became global, the crisis has become systematized and endemic, and the recovery is never a real recovery for the mass of the workers. The spiral is only downwards. The more wealth humanity produces, the poorer the mass of humanity becomes. This is the future for workers under capitalism. This is the future of humanity without Marxism. So yes, it matters. And that's why we, brought these two, why we brought these two texts together today, is because they go hand in hand. Workers have two things they need. One of them is theory, and the other is organization, and we must have them both. Because without both, again, we're useless. We can't be a discussing society sitting around agreeing with each other. We have to do something with what we've learned. How do we do something with what we've learned? Is it enough for us to just go as individuals and stand on the street corner and proselytize? Should we all become preachers? You know, very, very good preachers, fiery rhetoricians, I can't say that word, uh, standing on street corners and, and mobilizing people to go and study. It's, it's, it's a part of our job, isn't it? If we want to win the class struggle and replace one system with another, the working class must be organized. It must form an army, not any kind of army, disciplined, steeled, experienced, guided by the correct theory, but also, as Lenin said, welded together. It's discipline. It's centralization. Voluntary discipline welds us together into a force that is able to direct its efforts at particular points in particular moments in order to maximize our strength and to win. That's the whole point of all this work. We're not here to learn how to sound clever, to keep ourselves busy. We could all find hobbies. <laughs> We're here because we understand. I, I, I oh, Hapal uh, <laughs> says not me. Trust me, trust me, I've got hobbies coming out my ears. <laughs> or I would have, aspirationally. I aspire to hobbies. We could find ways to keep ourselves busy. We don't need to sit in this room trying to practice sounding clever to one another. The whole point is to use this theory to connect it with the masses, to enable the masses to move history forward, like we said before. They need organization to do it. The, the ruling class has this huge mechanism of repression. The working class has numbers. How do you make numbers of poor, weak individuals count? You organize them. Why is it the ruling class is at such pains to teach us to feel like individuals? <laughs> because as individuals, we have zero power, zero say about anything. As a force, we can do anything. Anything. We're unstoppable as a force. That is why the force that leads the working class, that directs its activity, has to be the most disciplined, the most steeled, the most committed. Committed to mastering and disseminating theory. Committed to activity. Disciplined in that activity. That's what we mean by when we say that the, the best elements need to be in the working class party, and the working class party must be totally disciplined body of people. That's why it matters what type of organization we have. That's the role of the party. We are forming, forging an army. 
a centrally directed, disciplined army that can win. That's the point of what we're doing here. Thank you, comrades. Thank you.